Welcome to Peculiar Stories, where we explore the fascinating world of near-death experiences and offer new perspectives on the meaning of life and death. Our goal is to shed light on these profound stories, deepen your understanding of life, and provide valuable insights to our audience. Whether you're new here or simply joining us again, we're thrilled to have you on this journey. If you enjoy what we do, consider subscribing to our channel to stay updated on our latest content. And don't forget to hit the like button to help our content reach a wider audience. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be transported to the edge of life and beyond. On today's story, Evelyn claims to see an entity compromised of light which she believes to be Jesus. She proceeds to share what she experienced with him and what she was told. Without further ado, let's get to the story. My name is Evelyn, and this is my story. I was operating a beat-up car when I lost control of it. The vehicle repeatedly rolled down a sloping embankment at an extended diagonal. I had the impression that my deceased father was supporting my head as I was being shaken around like a quarter in a box. I was in a dream where I was flying when I awoke. I was very good at flying. Since I can remember, I've had flying dreams, but this one stood out because I was still able to fly even when I thought about it. When I thought about the flight, I didn't land or descend. Instead, I just kept flying. When I tried to move forward, I moved slower, and when I tried to go down, I couldn't. As a result, when I tried to stop, I realized that I was being gently pulled upward. I realized at that point that something was happening and I was not dreaming. I peered at the tops of the fir trees and the area between me and the grass and the road as well as around me. I was able to see better than with my glasses when I gazed up at the sky in front of me and noticed that everything was in clear focus. Then I felt the chilly April air on my skin and the morning sun's warmth as it warmed the chilly air. I then looked down at the ground. My head was partially out of the damaged driver's side window as I looked down at my upside-down car with my body angled on top of it. If that's down there, then what's up there? I wondered. My astral body rolled and turned to face the sky. I think of what I witnessed as a vortex. A gap in the sky was filled with clouds and plasma-like lightning. Stars were present inside the hole but they were the universe's center rather than the stars we see at night outside our atmosphere. Like a galaxy revolving around the brightest light imaginable. It was the source, in my opinion. Light orbs of various brightnesses, hues, and forms were entering and exiting the hole directly outside it. At that point, I bowed down and exclaimed, Oh my God, you are. I knelt down and tightened up as much as I could inside of myself, as I realized how naive I had been. Since the day I was born, I've known that God exists. When I was younger, I would ask God how big the universe is just before going to sleep. Then I would close my eyes and try to get as far before falling asleep as I could. It would slightly bend my young mind to have traveled a great distance and realize that the cosmos was boundless. I had strong cognitive skills and was a math prodigy when I was young. By the age of six, I could divide by ten, and before I could speak, I had prophetic dreams. I had a dream about my family dying when I was eight. I told them in my dream that they would perish in an accident on the way to Nevada, but they ignored me. I wanted to believe the grown-ups in my life when they said it was all a dream because I did not want my parents to pass away. I was horrified by the accident of their plane on a mental, emotional, and spiritual level. I believed it was terrible of God to send me dreams like that, knowing I had no influence over the results, and to make matters worse, I was no longer able to discern reality with such clarity, so I pleaded with him to stop. Between that age and my accident, I had a number of further extraordinary encounters. In the meanwhile, I experienced a number of horrifying trials, separations, and traumatizing occurrences that no child should have to go through. It caused me to lose sight of God and my relationship with Him. I started doing drugs, having wild parties, and doing harm to both myself and others. Getting back to my experience, I was shown a review of my life from God's perspective, the truth, as I was on my face. Every time I had been self-centered and made decisions based solely on my personal interests, it had been made clear to me. Every time I had used manipulation or stoke up conflict for personal gain, I had it documented. The sorrow then multiplied many times over for me. My solar plexus felt like it had been hit by a beam, and the pain was so intense that I felt like I had lost all of my strength. I don't think I'm a bad guy, so I can't even begin to imagine how things might be if I had been violent or engaged in other wrongdoings against my fellow humans. A review like that, in my opinion, would be unbearable. 
an entity comprised of light then approached my side. I was neither religiously raised nor baptized. I could be mistaken, but it seemed to be what others refer to as Christ. It wasn't the Christ that we typically see in artwork or photos. It wasn't the Christ that we typically associate with evangelicals. It was neither the Christ of America or any other Christ figure I had encountered. I could hardly fathom the degree of compassion this person possessed in the tiny yet dazzling light that it was since it was a being so pure and benevolent. I wasn't even able to comprehend this incredible love until it touched me, said, I'll take it, it's for me, took the beam from me, and touched me. You are forgiven, he said, as his light appeared to wane for an instant, and the beam vanished. You were made of flesh, and what comes with flesh is biology, psychology, instinct, desire mechanism, ego, and all that goes with it. Being flesh means you will sin. It's just how things are. Being a human has no faults. I haven't felt this much relaxation since I experienced it. That is when I understood that he was a part of the greater light, and in a sense, a custodian of our planet. He was given the responsibility of ruling and keeping an eye on it, as well as providing direction and protection, as well as love and care. This was only what I could understand at the time, Yet this being was more than what he seemed to be to me at the time. I understood this. I became really thrilled and began to question like a young child. Are there any aliens, UFOs, alien life, parallel universes, and all of the above? That's when I heard a loud but quiet giggle of enjoyment, and it seemed like someone patted me on the head as they pointed to the top of my head as the source. While my head was trapped inside of it, it resembled a massive stream and I was able to observe everything and nothing from the very beginning. I had the memory of the entire cosmos, from the Big Bang to the Big Stop to the Big Bang and back again. I was knowledgeable in all fields, including cosmology, biology, spirituality, consciousness, being and non-being, physics, and mathematics. God is everything that has ever been, and everything that never will be. And since I am a human, I can only comprehend it in terms that make sense to me. Everything will be anthropomorphic since even the best of humanity is still human. It's similar to a chair mistaking a table for a bizarre chair with no back when it looks at a table. Even if the chair is unaware that it is one, it will nonetheless carry out its intended role. It might never doubt its chairness or attempt to transcend it, but a chair it is nonetheless. When I was about 14 years old, I used to wonder, if God is able to accomplish anything, can he make a rock so heavy that no one can move it? Yes. No, all at once, in one go, and absolutely nothing. After this profound revelation, I became aware that I was out of place, that I had a body, and that if I did not go back to that body, it would stop working because I was the thing that had accelerated it through time and space. At this moment, I apologized for interrupting the wonderful story and said that I was sincerely sorry, but I had to go back. I received a message that I needed to accept full responsibility for my actions. I hurriedly put myself together as best I could and whooshed back to the side of the light entity, Christ, at which point I jumped back to my body like a salmon swimming upstream. I re-entered from the top of my skull and it closed with a powerful whoomp, much like an airtight vessel. It resembled attempting to cram a supercomputer into an Amiga. It would simply not fit. I had a moment of departure and let go of some of my comprehension so that I could return to my vessel as soon as possible. I was aware that I might rejoin at a later time, and that it would be there for me whenever I returned, but right now, I needed to get a task done. I then reclimbed inside. It felt like a huge empty house that had been abandoned. It was cold, quiet, devoid of plumbing or power, and seemed echoey and black. I was on the verge of panicking when resolve took over. From my spinal cord to my extremities, I moved. I easily descended my right leg. When I attempted to descend my left leg, there was no connection. I ascended via my organs, entered my heart, circled my ribcage, descended my arms, and then returned to my head. I went to my medulla oblongata, or what I thought was the core of my brain, and I threw the switches like a captain. Okay, brain, let's start this body moving, I said. I instructed my blood to flow and my heart to beat, but to clot at my hip. I attempted to breathe after that. My breath began to whistle loudly. When I attempted to open my eyes, all I could see was blood. A sheet of gooey crimson paste had been placed over them. I blinked and got rid of it. The moment I started to move, 
A sound like a bag of stones rattling through my spine and into my head and brain caused me to stop. When the keys were still in the ignition, I could hear the buzzing of the open door and the static of the radio. It was ominous. A soldier was nearby when I turned to look. He was sobbing when I turned to face him. I thought you were dead, he said. Don't worry, I just spoke to God. Everything will be fine, I said. He was holding my hand as I observed his hat. You know, the one that's somewhat like a cowboy hat? When I told him that he was my hero, he replied that I was also his. When I mentioned that I was exhausted, he responded, No, you must stay awake, so talk to me. Give me the words of God. I admitted that I was entirely to blame for the disaster and inquired after my friends. He assured them they would be okay. He then told me what had taken place. I felt lightheaded from the buzzing, the radio, and the sound of the sky, and I almost passed out. The ambulance arrived, and I heard it. I objected as they were getting ready to use the jaws of life. That thing gave me the impression that it would kill me. I went outside by myself. My body twisted and groaned as my left leg followed suit. I was placed in the back of the vehicle with an IV, oxygen, and a trooper by my side. I was informed I could go to sleep while he held my hand. Radiology equipment includes x-rays, heart monitors, lights, needles, masks, noises, blood, beeping, talking, Latin, math, and law. Dizziness. Pain. I was in and out of consciousness in the intensive care unit for 36 hours. I received a morphine epidural, and I was convinced that spiders were everywhere. Undoubtedly, a priest and nuns were present. While they waited for my mother to arrive, they continued coming in and praying, and the priest at least three times gave me last rites. I spent the majority of the time hovering above my head, viewing everything like a circus. Every time they began with the last rites, I would re-enter my body and command them to stop since I was still alive. My body disagreed with my spirit, which knew everything was okay. I am aware that my body believed it would die multiple times, but my spirit didn't buy any of it and continued to exist. Christ, who is made of light, appeared right then. He appeared stunning, just like a Jew. A handsome face with wide brown eyes, a strong jawline, and long black curling hair. He donned a rope fiber tied monk's robe made of cloth. There was nothing special, but it was flooded with the most beautiful light imaginable. He looked worried while grinning knowingly. I got going. Whoa! The way you do that is awesome. How did you simply do that? Are you here? What's up there? You were there, but why are you here now? I heard you. It's amazing how well you can do it. Suddenly you appear. You're amazing. Thanks. So what? You must now practice living the truth. Is that it? That's simple. I can handle it. I followed your advice. I was honest and accepted responsibility. I am capable. He said, I know, as if he were pleased with me. It might be the hardest thing you've ever had to do. It won't always be simple. He turned to face the cross. All of a sudden I understood it. When he touched my hand, I felt warmth throughout my entire body. I was stabilized and kept in my body. They sent me to Minneapolis so that the brilliant Dr. Templeman could perform my innovative, groundbreaking surgery, which would set the standard for a new kind of bone rebuilding process. Funny, huh? Templeman? I was hospitalized for five weeks before being discharged to a nursing home where I would rehabilitate for six months. To stand will be to hold my heart. To walk will be to move my spirit. And to dance will be to claim my soul, I used to jot in my journal. I was able to walk at nine months, stand up six months later, and now I can dance pain-free. Now, Evelyn's experience shows what happens to those who are self-centered and live a sinful life is not pleasant. But it doesn't fully grasp where exactly they end up in the afterlife, to understand that watch this near-death experience next.